Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel. I am so glad to have you guys here. If you are new to my channel, my name is Dr. Daniela Fisher and I am a board certified anesthesiologist. And today I am jumping on the Dr. Reacts to Grey's Anatomy episode bandwagon. I think that this kind of sort of type of video was started by Dr. Mike and other doctors on YouTube have done it, such as Mama Dr. Jones, the lovely Christina Brawley. And so I thought that today I would find an anesthesia related episode for you and also watch it and give you guys my thoughts about the anesthesia parts of a Grey's Anatomy episode. I have not ever been a Grey's Anatomy watcher. I think that it came out in 2005 when I was a first year anesthesia resident and everybody was like telling us to watch Grey's Anatomy. It was so amazing, this and that. And one night I think we turned on an episode and they were intubating a deer in the ER. And I turned to my husband, I was like, no, mm -mm, nope, we cannot do this. This is over. We're never watching this show again. And I never did watch a Grey's Anatomy episode ever again after that. So today is going to be the first time I have ever watched a Grey's Anatomy episode, but I'm going to watch this episode. I'm going to react and what a fun way to learn. What's better than watching TV and learning at the same time. So let's do that. If you are new here, make sure that you hit the subscribe button, make sure that you hit the notification bell, and be sure to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Danny Fisher. Victims of a sudden impact are some of the hardest to treat. Uh, uh, we need to get you off this road, honey. Jessica, answer me. Uh. Okay, so they've set up what is going on in the show. There's been a bad motor vehicle accident and this entire family, it seems like except for the older daughter, have been terribly hurt in this car accident. You did extraordinary work tonight, Crow. I've got it from here. What? No. Yes, you were in a major accident. You need to go get yourself checked out. Take a breath. You're going to sit this one out. I'm not sitting anything out. Yeah. So this is true. Doctors do not miss work really for anything. And I also didn't miss work when I got into a major car accident myself. Last December, I was headed to 24 hours of OB call on a Sunday morning. It was seven o'clock and I was driving and somebody went through a red light and T-boned me at an intersection and actually flipped my car. So my car flipped a couple times and I landed upside down. I was suspended by my seatbelt upside down. And when the car stopped rolling, all the airbags had come down and I realized that I was suspended upside down and I couldn't get myself out of the car. And when a bystander came up to the car and said, hey, are you okay? The first thing I said was, I need you to call the following phone number at the hospital and let them know I'm gonna be late for call. And so the lady called the hospital for me. Once they extracted me from the car, the ambulance came, the ambulance wanted to take me to the hospital and I said, no, no, I'm totally fine, but can you drop me at the hospital because I really need to get to work? And so the ambulance actually said no, I think because they were privately owned and so they couldn't drop me at the hospital, but the fire engine said they would. So I left my upside down totaled car in the middle of the road and the fire engine dropped me at the hospital. They pulled around the front of the hospital with me and all of my bags. Amazingly, I did not have a scratch on me. So anyway, that happened to me and I did a 24 hour shift and people still make fun of me for that. But I think I was so happy to be alive that I was like happy to just go to work and do my 24 hour shift. So yes, this is true. Even after major accidents, doctors will sometimes go to work if they're okay. Internal bleeding, can keep a systolic of 68. Okay, there's definitely free fluid in his abdomen. It's just harder to find where the bleeding's coming from. Where do you want to start? Abdomen. Yeah, we couldn't wait to sleep in a tent. Sir, I'm Dr. Hunt. BP still dropping. We're going to be taking you up the street. Really didn't even want to come. This is not how a scene like this would actually go down in real life. If a patient comes in from a trauma and he's got unstable vital signs, which this patient does because they said his blood pressure is dropping and they showed the vital signs on the monitor showing that his blood pressure was dropping. And they said that he's got free fluid in the abdomen, which actually means probably he's got blood in the abdomen. This is an unstable situation and we would want, this patient's probably gonna lose consciousness very soon. So we would want to put a breathing tube in as soon as possible. So either the ER team or a team of anesthesiologists would come in and intubate this patient. The reason that we want to intubate a patient like this is one, he's likely going to go to surgery because he's got internal bleeding. And number two, because he's just been in an accident, he probably ate something tonight. He's got what we call a full stomach. And if he regurgitates the contents of water into his stomach and they get into his lungs, 
the acids of our stomach and the food in our stomach in our lungs that is not compatible with life so the surgeon would not be there like chit-chatting with the patient at this point we would be getting the patient intubated stat and we would be getting them to the operating room since they are bleeding I keep trying. she already watched the grandmother die yeah just... go go <laughs> How long is it going? What have you given her? Whatever rhythm's been? She's been coding for 30 minutes. She's already gotten lidocaine and amyobarone. Okay, her kid's outside the window watching. We need to go again. <laughs> Clear. Push another Avepi. Let's charge again. Dr. Gray. Damn it. Charge again. Clear. Yeah, this is not at all how a situation would happen like that. When patients' families, when there is a trauma and patients' families are around, we make every effort to remove the families from where we are trying to work on trauma patients. We do not want the families to get major PTSD by watching us, certainly coding a mother, for example. So there is no way that a family member would be watching us code their parent, and certainly if they were, somebody would take them away. You would not be looking out the window coding the patient and looking at the daughter watching you code their parent. Here is the biggest thing that she did wrong there. She shocked a patient that had a flat line, and flat line means asystole. So there are shockable rhythms, what we call shockable rhythms, and what we call non-shockable rhythms. Asystole, a flat line, and what we call PEA are two non-shockable rhythms. So you would not shock them. So she totally treated that patient incorrectly. What she should have done was give the patient epinephrine and do chest compressions. The most important thing is epinephrine and chest compressions because chest compressions are what get blood to the heart and the brain, the two most vital organs. So um, the two shockable rhythms that we can shock are V-fib and V-tac. Heard you lost one of your clinical trial patients today, Dr. Bailey. I'm sorry to hear Was that. it my trial that killed him? The man suffered from von Hippel-Lindau. That's what killed him. Well, I wasn't implying that you're trying. Let's focus on the living patients and not the dead ones, OK? OK, so that surgeons don't talk to anesthesiologists that way. Generally speaking, surgeons and anesthesiologists are really good friends. and. Many of the surgeons that I work with, I've known for years and years, and many of them I went to medical school with. So surgeons and anesthesiologists have really good relationships, and that's important. It's good for the patient when the surgeon and the anesthesiologist get along well, because that allows for open communication and good patient care. If a surgeon kind of talks down to an anesthesiologist like this, in my view, it really disrupts uh, communication, the lines of communication, and that is not good for the patient. So I'm really, really glad that where I work, this kind of thing, that does not go down. What'd you do? Nothing, I'm just irritating. Some kind of spike, CO2 levels are through the roof. Well, what's the problem? Oh, he's tachycardic. The increased heart rate, but the patient's burning up. Okay, I didn't use sucks, but I did use it for fluorine. Ice. We need ice. Wait now, this is my patient. Run, get ice now. Right away, doctor. Kid's about to go into organ failure. I'm pushing Vangeline. Let's get some cooling blankets. On it. And turn the thermostat down here as low as it will go. Right away, doctor. Oh my God, malignant hypothermia. Where's that ice? This is interesting. So what the patient is experiencing is called malignant hyperthermia. And malignant hyperthermia is just a reaction to anesthetic drugs that we use. And the two classes of anesthetic drugs that can cause malignant hyperthermia are inhaled anesthetics. He called it sevoflurane. It's actually pronounced sevoflurane. And the other drug is called succinylcholine. And these are drugs we regularly use in anesthesia. And what happens to the patient is just what we saw happening here. The heart rate will go up. The temperature will go up significantly. The temperature can go all the way up to 110 degrees, which obviously is not compatible with life. The patient experiences um, what we call high CO2. The patient's muscles become rigid and muscles can start to break down. That can lead to the spilling of potassium out into the blood, and that can lead to organ failure, 
and most notably it can lead to the heart stopping cardiac arrest. So he was doing absolutely the right thing. He was treating the patient, he, he recognized it, number one. Number two, he was treating the patient with a drug called dantrolene, which is what we use to treat malignant hyperthermia. And we do pack the patient with ice, that was correct. We do turn down the room temperature. I thought it was kind of funny that the surgeon recognized after the fact, like a little late, she's like, oh, it's malignant hyperthermia. Um, clearly the anesthesiologist had recognized it right when it was happening. So yeah, that was really good. They did all the right stuff. Yay! Dr. Warren, isn't malignant hypothermia genetic? You gotta go one. Already on it. How's she doing? Well, she's a little full of herself if you ask me, but she's getting the job done, I guess. No, the kid, Abby. Oh. You gotta watch her temp if you gave her any sucks or inhalation anesthetics because our kid had a reaction. Mer I love how Meredith remembers that malignant hyperthermia runs in families. So it turns out that malignant hyperthermia, which we call MH, um, is actually an autosomal dominant trait. So people that are at risk for having MH have usually a family member, usually a parent who has experienced this in the past and because their parent has experienced it, they know to go get either a genetic test or a muscle biopsy to find out if they are at risk for having malignant hyperthermia. But the patient that they're operating on was one of five siblings or four siblings that was all in trauma in a car accident. And so she recognizes that siblings are also being operated on right now. And so she needs to go tell them in the operating room that those patients may also be at risk for MH. So I love how she runs in the room and she's like, have you used an inhalational anesthetic or sucks? So we use inhalational anesthetics on every single case, unless it's a sedation case, we use inhalational anesthetics all the time. So it was just kind of funny that she asked, are you using it? Cause like, yeah, obviously we're always using inhalational anesthetics, but it's really good that she was warning them that one of the siblings may get MH2, love it. He's coding. Push one of did she just do a precordial thumb? Hold on, let's back that up. Yes, she did. She did a precordial thump. That is so funny, you guys. So what a precordial thump is, is banging somebody on the chest. If you are out of the hospital and you witness somebody go into cardiac arrest, they fall on the ground, you feel their neck, they have no pulse, you can give them a precordial thump, which is a very small shock to their heart. But like when you're out of the hospital and you have no other resource, that's a reasonable thing to do, but it's so funny that she did a precordial thump when they're in a hospital with defibrillators right there. So in this case, a precordial thump would not be appropriate because they have actual defibrillators, which can offer an actual shock to a patient who's got a shockable rhythm. Push one of every one of that. Charge pound, 200. Charging. Charge. Clear. Yeah. So this patient actually had a shockable rhythm. She did the right thing this time. Go Meredith. Yes, you did it right this time. I noticed that they took the patient off of the ventilator and they started ambuing the patient, which makes absolutely no sense. If you're coding a patient and the patient's already on a ventilator, that's perfect. That means that the patient is being oxygenated and ventilated from the ventilator. They already have the breathing tube in. That means all you need to concentrate on are chest compressions and shocking a rhythm that is indeed shockable. So it makes no sense that they disconnected the patient from the ventilator and put the Ambu bag on. That's being silly. You don't do that. Yeah, please. Lily, I'm sorry, you can't be in here. Wait. Charge pass to 300. Charging. Charge. Clear. That was Paige, code blue. The patient was not connected to the ventilator or an Ambu bag anymore. So the patient was not being oxygenated. That's like a major no-no. When you are coding somebody, you wanna make sure that they're attached to a ventilator, especially if they're intubated, you wanna make sure that they're attached to some source of oxygen so that the chest compressions are actually pumping oxygenated blood to the heart and the brain. Okay, you guys, I think that is enough for one day. This was very interesting. Maybe I'm gonna watch more Grey's Anatomy. I kind of liked it. I need to get into the plot line a little bit more so I know what's actually going on in the story. But um, I hope that you guys liked this and enjoyed this. Please let me know if you did down below and I'll make more videos like this. Give the video a thumbs up if you thought it was fun or funny or useful. And thank you guys for joining me today for this very first Dr. Reacts to Grey's Anatomy video. And I will look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Bye.